Hello and welcome to This Week on the Water. I'm Hannah White. Firstly, we talked to David Carr about the Extreme 40s Lively Week in Trapani and Paul Campbell-James talks us through being at the top of the leaderboard. Also to France and the Voile de Saint-Tropez, where in the mini maxi class, Spirit of Jetu have finally found a return to form. But now, our main headlines this week. Lucy McGregor is crowned World Women's Match Racing Champion after winning in New York. She becomes the first ever Briton to win the event in the 12-year history. The Volvo Ocean Race have confirmed that they will be hosting another virtual game for 2011. Once again, in partnership with United Games, organisers are confident of beating last edition's 220,000 participants. Audi have announced their ongoing commitment to the Audi Med Cup for at least another three years, with the smaller boats changing from a GP42 to a Soto 40. With Quantum building a new TP52, Synergy and Luna Rossa have also committed to the series next year. And finally, in the Velux 5 Oceans, two skippers have been excluded from the starting lineup after failing to meet qualification requirements of the race organisers. But now to Trapani, where David Carr of Oman Sail Mazira tells us about the breezy conditions they had last week. Yeah, it was an amazing event in all honesty, Hannah. Like I've been sailing these boats for four years and I cannot remember in a venue where we sailed in such confined space. And to coincide with that, we had massive wind, basically. So um, to, it's safe to say that everyone was pretty nervous all week. Like we're all on the edge of capsizing and all like struggling to bear the boats away. But it was still a, still a good regatta despite the, uh, the massive winds. And you had a little bit of a close call where you nearly capsized. Um, there is some amazing footage of it. Just talk me yeah. through that. Yeah, it was a really short race course and so short that we talked about not hoisting the spinnaker down the first run because uh, obviously you need to get weight off the rail to hoist and then you obviously double the horsepower on the boat going downwind. So we had a little discussion about not hoisting and then basically testosterone got the better of us when we got to the windward mark hoisted the chute, unfurled and realised that the lured mark was a lot closer than we thought and did a crash jibe, like got the spinnaker in on the new side and had to do a jibe drop and just as we were coming into the lured mark to do a jibe drop, we all moved out position and uh, a, a huge, huge gust hit and uh, yeah, like uh, like I've said before, it was literally like a sea monster grabbed the bow of our boat and pulled us under and I was on the front beam at the time, which is not a good place to be in that situation. And the water went over the front beam, and and all the rest of the lads were hanging onto beam bolts, trying not to uh, trying not to fall in. And Luke was being very French and Gallic about it all, but you could tell he was a bit scared. And we got away with it by the skin of our teeth. But uh, it was a heart in the mouth moment, and it's probably thirty, well, twenty seconds of sailing I'll never forget. That's for sure. Coming into the event, it was Group Edmond de Rothschild who were leading the overall standings. But by the penultimate day, it was Paul Campbell-James on the wave musket who took control. In the end, Paul not only secured himself a win in Trapani, but now leads the overall standings by just one point. Battling it out for the rest of the podium positions are Mike Golding on Ecova, Loic Perron on Oman Sail Mazira and Yang Guichard on Group Edmond de Rothschild. Just four points separate the top four teams. Paul Campbell-James now talks us through his winning formula. I've got a really good team for a start um, and we've just done a bit more training than everyone else I think and you know especially when it gets windy you know a lot of teams are pretty uh, anti going out because you know they don't want to break stuff and uh, and we've just kind of been going out you know and um, very much pre-season a lot of pre-season training and um, there was a big gap between the first and second events and we uh we did a lot in that time, and um, yeah, I think just we've basically been out in the big breeze more than everyone else. We knew it would be, or we thought at the beginning of the season that it was going to be uh, a big weakness of ours because we were down, we were down about 40 kilos on most people's crew weight. Um, but it turns out that you know, a bit of practice and um, a bit of confidence in the breeze, and actually, it's kind of where we're strongest. Thanks, Paul. And now to Saint Tropez, where 300 yachts are competing in the, one of the final events of the 2010 Mediterranean Circuit, the Voile de Saint Tropez. Modern and classics over 16 metres are vying for the prestigious Rolex Trophy. 
Light winds have plagued the fleet, with the modern boats benefiting from better breeze on their offshore course. Inshore, the classics rarely saw above six knots, until later in the afternoon. Under IRC and after two races, it's Shamrock 5 that leads the way, ahead of the TP52 Artemis, who are tied in third, with surprise formers Spirit of Jetu. Meanwhile, Valshida and Ran have been left out of the podium positions for now. After a disappointing season, Sir Peter Ogden's Udall Vrolic designed 60-foot Mini Maxi has found a return to form in Saint-Tropez, and tactician Ian Budgen tells us why. Yeah, uh, we are having a great regatta here. The, uh, the, the format of the courses and, and the conditions uh, it fit, sort of it, it suit us reasonably well here and suit the boat characteristics as, as well as which, uh, as a, a team, we've, uh, we've sailed quite well or, or very well for the first few days. So, uh, so, so that always makes quite a big difference. Now, rumour has it, Budgie, that you have a bit of a secret weapon on board this week uh, in the guise of Brad <coughs> Butterworth. <laughs> um, it must be great for you guys to have his wealth of knowledge on board. Has it had quite an impact on the team? Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, been, it's been a fantastic opportunity. I mean, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, Sir Peter Ogden actually knows Brad uh, outside of sailing. Uh, and, and, and therefore, when we were looking at ways to move the program forward to the next level, then uh, then Peter took the opportunity to invite Brad along to get his experience and expertise, you know, as, as, as one of the top sailors in the world, to come and give his opinion on how we can move forward as a crew and, and how we can move the boat forward. So uh, so obviously that's, uh, that's been uh, a factor in our uh, success here this week. And, uh, and I hope that uh, could, you know, moving forward to next year, that we'll see the uh, the things which, which Brad suggests and, and the things that we learn this week uh, basically carry on to uh, to increase our performance again next year. Uh, it's really good, you know. Uh, uh, I've sailed with some, and, and we've all sailed with some very good people, and uh, and, and the best way to learn is not through trial and error. The best way to learn is from the best people. Uh, so, uh, so it's a great opportunity, and and, uh, and uh, we're all very privileged, really. That's about all we've got time for today. But the doc chat is that the party of the week was held in Saint Tropez, courtesy of Sir Peter Harrison, celebrating a hundred thousand miles sailing in Sojana. And looking ahead to next week and the Bermuda Gold Cup, the teams, including Ben Ainsley, Ian Williams and newly crowned women's world match race champion Lucy McGregor, can expect hot and humid conditions with 18 to 20 knots from the southeast for most of the week. Thanks very much for joining us and see you all again next week.